the new calyx is always the uh the way to start questioning every decision you've ever made about organizing. <laughs> I'm already like, I probably Hi, <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, uh, those of you who aren't trying to buy something from us at this very moment, uh, <laughs> welcome to the <laughs> Mondo Happy Hour. My name is Mo Shafiq. I work at Mondo Records. And I'm Spencer. I also work at Mondo. Records. We are Mondo Records with our friend Shannon. He's not here today. Uh, let's go around the horn and everyone introduce themselves, starting to, uh, well, I guess I don't know if everyone sees the same screen that I do, but Ross, Michelle, why don't you introduce yourselves? Uh, Ross. I'm Michelle from Enjoy the Ride Records and Enjoy the Tunes. Are we going uh, down with me? Yeah. yeah. Let's okay. Let's <laughs> uh, I'm from Tiger Lab Vinyl. Uh, Oh, we'll do we'll do a Brady Bunch style. Let's do let's do that yeah. row oh. right here. <laughs> let's save Alice for last. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm Aaron from uh, I'm Aaron from uh, Ship to Shore Phono Co. Hi everyone. I'm JC Chambaradon from Milan Records. Hi, I'm Darren from Burning Witches Records. I'm Ryan from Terrorvision and Greyface. Cool. So I would imagine most of you know these guys. You probably should all know our guest and friend who's going to host the show for us tonight. It's Matt from Too Many Records. Um, if you don't follow his YouTube, you should. Um, you should also join his Facebook community. It's super active. Um, and he's a good friend of ours, and we thought it'd be really fun to have him kind of moderate the show for us today. So me and Mo can actually relax a little bit. Glad to be here. Um, it's cool to be here among these uh, soundtrack titans. I have records from every single person here in my chaotic collection room. So uh, really happy to be here talking talking vinyl, you know, my favorite thing to do. So uh, I know there's a lot of really cool things that later are going to be kind of teased, which is awesome. But before that, there's some questions I think I have for everyone and anyone can answer any of them or all of them. And we can just kind of go one by one, but I think a nice, you know, preschool icebreaker would be good at first. Um, I figured I want to know beyond just obviously the soundtracks everyone works on, what is one of your favorite albums of the year and the last album you, you remember spinning? So if we want to just go around and answer that however you'd like. Oh man. Uh, the last album I remember spinning, truthfully, I think I, I have something up here right now. I, I This is sad. <laughs> Always a good way to start. Well, okay, sad, sad that uh, this is the, the state of affairs, right? So I ordered this, the, uh, the Light in the Attic, uh, Beatball, uh, Korean funk compilation, and I ordered it back in November of 2020 and with another record that, uh, that just, I guess, was back-ordered. And I recently, I, about a week and a half ago, got an email from Lida saying, hey, sorry, that other record you ordered is still back ordered. And so, you know, sorry, it'll be another couple of months. And I was like, oh my God, I buy so many records that I forgot that I bought a record <laughs> eight months ago and just was just sort of like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. That's fine. And so they sent this to me anyway. And I finally listened to it. It's great. It was worth the eight month wait, but uh, this is what I've been listening to. And I got really into like Japanese and Korean city pop. Thanks a lot, Aaron. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but it's been uh, it's been a huge thing for me. And uh, that's 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 my answer. I um I spun the Sisters of Mercy record store day release today. Nice. How'd it sound? Really good, man. Although I was got got to be honest. I was sat there looking at it. It's a double record in a single sleeve. And I was like, I wish they'd have let us do this. Because it's just, you know, a lot of these tracks were unreleased, never got released. So I was a little bit bummed out. But it sounds really good, man. And then I think one of my favorite records this year is the For Those I Love record, which is kind of like a cross between the streets and um, Fontaine's DC. Um, it's just like this Irish used to be in a punk band he's kind of like a poet um and he's made this record about his best friend that died and it's one of one of the best records i've heard in the last five years and everyone wants to check it out it's amazing cool um sage of day and reverie we just spun like right before this uh the new reissue was pretty awesome that's so um, funny mo and i were just talking about that record yesterday yeah it's so good um and, and john mayer wait wait they, they reissued it What's up? They reissued in Reverie. Yeah, uh, like two months ago. 
Or, oh, I didn't even know uh, that. Yeah, yeah. Mo, I didn't know Mo, that. Mo, that kills our entire conversation we had. It sold out like I a know, new know. But yeah, uh, Pardon Gift Records is a newer label that did it. They came out really Oh, well. yeah. I'm going to have to look that up. After the chat, send me the details. I'm, I'm really yeah. curious about that. I'm assuming it's long gone. Yeah, they sold that real quick. Perfect. Great. Another 10 years. Hopefully they'll repress. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Michelle. We talked over your answer. No, that's okay. Um, we actually, we listened to Ross's copy of John Mayer's Sob Rock, but I got my two in the other day because I want to test out my pink one and then my Target one. I got the Coke bottle clear. But I have, I was probably like, if I look at my shop app on my phone, because it links to Shopify, there's like five or six pre-orders that are just sitting there that I'm just waiting to come. So we'll see. Future Christmases. Yeah. John, how about you? Um, last thing I spun before coming up to the Cape was uh, the newest Rainforest Spiritual Enslavement record. Oh, cool. Um, Oh, that's I, good. Yeah, I think um, just because it's the newest and the freshest, I'll say that's my favorite of the year so far. But uh, yeah, I think it's incredible. I mean, all, all of this stuff is. But yeah. yeah, yeah, been waiting for it. John, do you want to tell everyone why you're the only one who is sitting on a beach right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, came up to Cape Cod first day uh, on the beach for the week. So I wasn't going to miss this. So that's why I'm outside loving the weather. <laughs> Uh, well, how about you, Aaron? Uh, yeah, the last. So I'm, I've been so behind on records I bought. I finally listened to the last record store day stuff I picked up. So I listened to uh, uh, the Warren Zevon Preludes, the 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 remastered version of that that came out, which was amazing. And in terms of my favorite album so far this year, it's probably. Um, the dry cleaning album that came out. I don't know if anybody's heard that uh, album. But that, it's like, uh, that sells for crazy money. Man. Really? I'm hoping because I'm seeing them here in New York and uh, they're coming in October. They, I hope they, 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 I hope they have version? copies of it. Yeah, that yeah. version sells for like 400 bucks already. Oh, wow. Which is Maybe I'll have to get on Discogs <laughs> to well, sell it. I got, I got that one. I love that album though. It's really good. I highly recommend anybody who hasn't heard it listen to that it's really good stuff cool yeah. darren and we have a new face this time Hello. we need uh, to, yeah. to grill him uh, the <laughs> last thing i spun today uh johnny marr comet tripper live album i just picked that up last weekend so i've been enjoying that and uh I'm looking forward to the new Quicksand album. That's that's what I'm waiting for this year. Nice. Nice. <laughs> well, given yeah. me, given my personal situation, I'm deep, deep into the Peppa Pig discography right now. It's one of the like that. Yeah. And in my free time, uh, except Peppa Pig, I discovered this really new <laughs> Japanese band called Millennium Parade, uh, which is a mix of electronic, hip hop, uh, and pop, which is a collective from Tokyo, and it's uh, very exciting new music. But it's not on the level of Peppa Pig, I would say yet. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing really is, to be honest. <laughs> is there Peppa Pig vinyl out there already? No, it's only on, no, not yet. <laughs> Is that a tease? Is, I think we for it. We should task Brian with putting Peppa Pig. Yeah, on. yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. What have you been listening to, Ryan, man? You're always into some freaky. Uh, yeah. I, I've been digitizing all this, all this shit lately. Excuse the language. Um, like these unheard uh, John Wayne Gacy interviews from Death Row. No. That's what? that's what I that's what I jam to. Just some light <laughs> some light casual listening. <laughs> I mean, yeah. this shit's yeah. incredible. It's like literally no one has ever heard this psychopath rambling. Do you so. listen to it before you go to sleep? You just put your headphones on and just go to bed well, to it. I don't sleep, so <laughs> no. no. <laughs> uh, other than. 
creepy shit. I listened to the the first personal effects EP this morning, which was a nice pick me up. I don't know if anyone listens to them, but kind of like B fifty twos, but uh, not B fifty twos. Awesome. Uh, so I'll answer quickly. My favorite album of the year so far is probably the Kings of Convenience record. It's um, just extremely laid back, bossa nova inspired, harmonic singer songwriter stuff like they've always done. And it's nothing different than they've ever done really, but it's more of what I love. Um, and the last record I spun was actually this. I don't know if any of you guys got this on Record Store Day. It's a Mega Man inspired rap album called Mega Ran, Mega Ran 9. It was sold out when I, when I went looking. It is an extremely, well, I mean, Mega Man is a great MC, but like, it's, it's a, if you don't know anything about Mega Man, it's still a good rap album, which is wild, but all the lyrics are like a story about Mega Man. So it's great production and awesome rapping. So if you're a hip hop fan, check it out. Um, the question I feel like I have to ask everybody. I, so I have a very small record label, but all you guys have more sizable ones. Everybody, myself included, is dealing with these crazy shipping delays. So it is not but a lot of people and i have to tell this to people you know who follow my channel it is not the label's fault the plants are just so overwhelmed right now because vinyl is at such an insane year after year high uh every plant is just like running around freaking out because the the amount of orders just far far exceeds the amount of manpower so how are you guys anyone can jump in on this one how are you guys dealing with these delays painfully <laughs> Very <boring. laughs> um I, I guess we were we we're quite lucky that we me and my tapped a bunch of capacity throughout the year so even though we are we're facing delays i mean I, i'll be honest like our turn times for the last six years have been six weeks tops and now it's like six to eight months um but because we we kind of um, we tapped this capacity in January. We're okay. So we've got a few things, I mean, a couple of things working with on the land and that are being released this year that will come out this year. But it's tough, man. And I think talking to our rep last week, they think it's going to be worse next year. So I just want to throw that out there for whoever you want to do. Uh. Great. Yep. So they, they think the supply chain stuff is going to get worse next year. So the pellets is going to skyrocket. There's going to be card shortages. That So I think we're looking at a good another 18 months of this, maybe. This maybe. is how CDs make their comeback. This is it. This is the moment. This is CDs moment. <laughs> Anyone tempted by that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, no, you know what? Um, <laughs> we talked about doing a CD this week. I don't know if we want it. No, we were not even going to talk about it. But like, we talked about because the artist, the composer, normally does CDs themselves. Right. I was like, like, I was like are you talking? Are you talking about me, Spencer? I can't remember who you're talking to. I was like, you're doing a secret CD side project with one of these people. No, no, me and you talked about it. <laughs> Me, you and Shannon discussed this this week. So a composer we work with a bunch of times, like they always like they always release their own CDs, and they just said said to Mo, "Not we're not not going to bother, man. It's not worth it." So I was like, I'd actually do that on CD if we could come up with an interesting package idea. Yeah. To, to not to bury the lead, but also on top of our vinyl release as well. So it'd just be like doing what they norm, what that that composer would normally have done, and still fill that void because that still is. Some people still really do buy CDs. I know it's not uh, a big thing, but obviously you make five hundred of them, it, it, you 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 go ahead and at least supply that demand. Um, one of my favorite anecdotes from this entire year, speaking of supply chain shortages, was somebody told me, and I never confirmed this, so this may be bullshit, so maybe someone can confirm this for me who's a fan of his, but that The weekend released his 10th anniversary of House of Balloons. The 10th year anniversary would have been this March, and they put up a pre-order that would ship in March of 2022 and the 11th anniversary. That is correct. Yeah. <laughs> I, saw, I saw that, and people got really, really upset. <laughs> <laughs> Packaging is supposed to be something crazy. I don't remember exactly what the details were. But it was something very elaborate and artistic, but still, that's ridiculous. <laughs> but like, how how uh, like 
Aaron, how are you dealing with it, Jace? Like, how is everyone dealing I mean, with it? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much the same as what you're saying. I mean, we were, um, I don't know if we were smart or just lucky, but we put in a lot of things uh, like at the end of last year and the beginning of this year. So we'll have a pretty good amount of stock coming through the end of the year. But I was actually talking to my rep at the plant yesterday, and he was saying the same thing, that don't really expect it to get much better until like early 2023, at least back to any sort of semblance of normalcy. Though he did send me a very interesting article uh, in Billboard, which had a, an amazing statistic that if vinyl demand could actually be met this year, the amount of records would be more than the format's peak in 1978, which just blew my mind. Wow. So, wow. Um, that yeah, is crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> Wow. Come on, Ryan. I know you've got stories about plants, man. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it hasn't been that bad. I I know I know that's not a controversial statement, but or maybe it is controversial. Um it's been fine. I don't know. I it's only running like four months for me. So it doesn't seem it doesn't seem too different than it used to. Um, it's for me maybe like a month longer, but I don't know. We've got probably six more things coming out on Terravision this year, and four more on Graveface. So I, I I don't see anything that I have to bump to 2022 yet. So that's good. Um, I'm, I'm always curious yeah. about how like a, a major label versus like a mid-sized label versus a super indie label, like how their order goes up in a queue. Cause like I have a small, small label. I put something in in a plant in February and it wasn't set to press till October. And I know that's a little absurd. Um, but that sounds ridiculous. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But I wonder how that would work if I was uh, Warner Music. Like, would that would that have been like uh, July? Like, I don't know. Like, does anyone have any insight on how that works? Yeah. I mean, you know, we've been part of Sony for two years now, and they have the same problem. Uh, there's no decide on, and I deal with that with licensors. They say, oh, can you put it in front of the line because you're Sony? And it really doesn't work that way. I mean, without mentioning name, same thing for the weekend. There are major Sony artists who have to postpone their vinyl releases of like six months because of the delays. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there is favor here and there. I think the quantity also is is a factor. Uh -huh. uh, but it's not like they prioritize really. I don't think it's like a trend of like making sure that the major get it get in there first. I think it's the, the broker thing versus just doing it a la carte, honestly. Like, I've been doing most, I would say 90% of my releases a la carte for 22 years. And um, if you do it a la carte, it seems fine, honestly. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the, the brokers are so backed up that that seems to be, and, and it's, trust me, it's much easier to use a broker. I, I love it. A um, little bit pricier, but, but that seems to be the main. You know, so I don't know. That's food for thought is go a la carte and you'll probably find it to be uh, far less time. Yeah, that's 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 what I do. And I'm, I'm on about four or five months. Yeah, same here. Yeah, the one the one release we're doing right now that we're doing uh, local here in New York at a pressing plant in Brooklyn is like four months so and we just deal directly with them yeah and it is a lot easier so but, it's, you it's know. a it's more of a headache to keep track yes. of but i mean honestly if it if you're kind of desperate to meet street dates i don't see why you wouldn't go about it that way personally right yeah that's why we did it for this one release because it had to be done by october yeah and they were the only that was the only way we could get it done because like packaging companies in the states are not they're not running behind at all i mean it's like four to six week turnarounds on packaging um mm -hmm. so clearly the problem is uh lacquering and stampers and whatnot but uh, do, do we think that the apollo fire did as much or more damage than we thought or was it kind of overblown in the sense of it didn't overblown really 
yeah <clears throat> way overblown yeah. that's that's the that's the feeling i'm getting too can anyone elaborate does anyone have any more info i i don't uh, i think that whole thing funny. was just people were freaking out because yeah. they what their favorite band they a master was lost or something and then it became this like huge story but it's kind of like a non-story it's a non-story yeah yeah all the rumors of vinyl apocalypse were highly overblown yeah yeah the vinyl apocalypse is coming next year <laughs> yes exactly yeah i've always just attributed to the fact that majors finally were just sort of like oh it used to be a thing they begrudgingly did right it was like oh this artist really wants vinyl that's annoying i guess we'll just do it and now it's yeah. like oh the only thing that people buy are vinyl so we will do it and also we're going to make more of them than we need to probably i noticed yeah. that um big lots is now selling vinyl i saw that Someone yeah. posted it in my in my group so, today, which is we want to talk about the vinyl apocalypse. Well, do you remember yeah. when everyone Whole Foods was selling vinyl? Nope. There no. Was I, remember, I remember when the thing was Tesco was selling vinyl, and that was the end of the end of days at one point, right? <laughs> I know Bed Bath Beyond was going into like they had like a Trolls exclusive like two or three years ago. <laughs> I still think the, the craziest thing I've ever seen is the Cracker Barrel exclusive records. Yeah. Uh, Oh, it's yeah. unbelievable. I saw those in person before I knew they were a thing. Yeah, was, I mean, yeah. It props to them for getting in on the game. Like, oh my god, I what, forgot. What release I, would be a Cracker Barrel exclusive? I actually don't know what would be an exclusive, but we <laughs> they got did, one uh, shipped to uh, us by uh, accident. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a lot of country. Yeah, it's oh, it's be band, that was it. I would imagine, yeah. yeah. Smokey and the Bandit was a Cracker Barrel exclusive, among other things. <laughs> <laughs> no words I never thought I'd hear in a sentence. Oh, God. It's true. Okay. FO has uh, reliably informed us that Cracker Barrel is still selling vinyl. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Um, I mean, more, more Cracker Barrel. Being able to see it in more places only helps the hobby, you know, making it more prevalent. Show it in a Cracker Barrel. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. I also in that same uh, in that same Billboard article I mentioned, I it, they also had uh, talked about how the average order for vinyl has gone in the last couple of years from like around four thousand to five thousand to now it's like seven to nine thousand as an average unit. That's size. that's because everyone's panicking that they're not going to be able to get a repress. So yep. that's where yeah. you could see in twelve months tons of overstocks in stores, man, and, and on shelves in distributors. So yeah, it's, it's interesting and tricky times, I think, man. Yep. Um, I, I want to shift to a question about um, the collector mentality. I, I've been collecting since 2012, and I've, I, I think for me, the first step with records is it has to sound good. Obviously, I'm in it for the sound, but I do have a massive appreciation for the whole package, getting to appreciate the art. And I will shout out to, to Ryan, um, when I first got into records, I remember the first thing that really blew me away were the hand pours that you were doing. I feel like that was like well ahead of like it's time and you know you're right. Of, but, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, a lot of places start, are, are doing similar things now, but I just remember being like, oh man, I got to get these gray face hand pours. They're incredible. We call them posers, dude. <laughs> yeah, so these posers are trying to jump in on the game. Whoa, um, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. That's someone who's I'm just not kidding. It. I'm, uh, but I, I'm curious, like with the rise of things like, and I'm gonna I'm gonna plug ETR Revolution up yesterday. I got my Mortal Kombat Liquid uh, Blood Filled record, which is unbelievably cool. And I remember, um, uh, you know, of course, Mondo's iconic Aliens record. Uh, we don't know, talk about that record. We're, we're gonna talk about it extensively for the next. Meeting. 20 minutes now uh, i'm curious uh, this is a two-part question the first part is how much do you guys think about collectors when coming up with variants like do you do you aim to do things that are like liquid filled hologram like the crazy stuff that's happening now and so like which releases do you like why do you decide to do that for certain releases well, I guess well, for film stuff, like, like, it has to be relevant. Like, we're, we're just not going to throw something in a record and, like, call it a day and be like, oh, hey, it's a filled record. We put something in. Like, it has to be something for the team. Yeah, we, we try not forcing it. And in general, like, we do a lot of variants, as most people watching us are probably aware. And I'm a big collector. 
I have been for like 15 plus years at this point. So I think that comes through. I try making stuff that I would want to buy personally in almost all cases, really. And we want it to look cool. Like if you're going to spend your money on something that you are going to enjoy, like it should look really nice, you know? Like I feel like that's, you know, like one of the perks now. Especially nowadays, like the records are getting more and more expensive. So like it should be a quality piece of art all across the board, be it sound and packaging and art when possible. Obviously some things are tricky, but best of our ability, you know, we try making it a collectible as much as a functional piece of music, you know? Totally. Yeah. I know that I personally get kind of stressed out about the the making things as rare and collectible because when we workshop ideas and what to make public, what what like what to make exclusive, what to make limited, or what to make you know more open edition, uh, I just have these flashbacks to being screamed at by the complete opposite sides of the same crowd, which was we did the Last of Us box set once. And uh, it, we we put it on sale. Our original CEO was like, keep it limited. It's going to be only one time pressing. We put it on sale and then it sold out in like two minutes and people were like picked up their pitchforks and just came screaming to kill us. And they were just like, "This, the, how dare you make something so small, so limited, blah, blah, blah. And so we're like, okay, okay, okay. okay. We're going to put them back up on sale and then we'll do like one more pressing of it so anyone can get it, right? And we did that. And then the other crowd was just like, <laughs> how fucking dare you make more of those? That is so against the rules. You sold it. And, and so like we were just being screwed. And so like in my head, like every time we have to set numbers or set what's going to be the exclusive and what's going to be the more collectible thing, I always just get like super panicky because I never want to be put in that position where we make so little that people riot against us or also that the thing, the other version is so undesirable to everyone else the second you make yeah, it something available. Yeah. I, I feel like you just summed up like the West Side Story part of this hobby where it's like you can never please both sides. There's always going to be people angry on either side. And the first part of this question is still open for anyone wants to answer, but that leads directly into my second part, which is I've noticed this outrage of like limited things getting sold out immediately and people being like, what about the people who just want to listen to it? And I made a video on this and I talked about it. And the thing that I proposed, I think makes a ton of sense, but as I would love to get the thoughts of all these wonderful labels and what you guys think of this. What are your thoughts on for releases that you know are going to be pretty in demand, having the limited variant or variants and then open pre-order for a black record. So everybody who wants to listen to it, you know, the exact demand for that, but the people that are really into like the collectible thing can still have a chance to get theirs. We, we always do a retail version. We've always done a retail version as, yeah. as long as our licenses are still active you should be able to buy that record in a record store. It may not be our first color, it may just be black or it might just be a solid color. But like we've always done it because we, you know, we are a record label. You know, we want people to listen to the records. We want people to be able to buy them. So we've always consciously made a, a sta you know, a standard version, you know, just a, a version that you could buy evergreen. I think that's really important, yeah. man. You know, also, it's so weird, right? Because people, people are, you only have to say hello to people these days on the internet, and they are outraged. Throwing them being collectors, and it's like 10 times worse, right? But like, there's always been limited editions. I'm fucking old. I've been buying records <laughs> since I was fucking eight years old with my father, right? Like, he took me to a record, he would take me to a record, WH Smith's, this like weird, shop that would sell stationery and they had like a big record character like back in the early 80s late 70s and we'd buy a record every week right and there were limited editions there and i remember buying the first soul mine and it came with a 12 inch that was limited it sold out but because people were not online you didn't hear how pissed off and upset people were so i think because of that you know we want to make sure that people can get it and I understand the frustration. I'm a collector, man. You, you don't get everything. Sometimes it takes years to to hunt that record down, and that's also part of the fun of, of being a collector. It's not all about I need this right now. I agree. I agree. The hunt is is literally like a, a large percentage of why collectors enjoy it. And then you get it, and you're like, I have it. Shelf. Like, it, yeah. Never listen to it. Yeah, you listen to it once. Yeah. 
yeah. I think in general, people just kind of take for granted like how many things are coming out and how much freedom, like this new artwork that like all of us or a lot of us do on a lot of these things. And like 15 years ago, when I started collecting, like there was maybe like one new release a couple every month or two. Every there was like maybe half a dozen a year of like real things that like I really were waiting a long time for. Now there's things literally daily, if not weekly. So like I think people are kind of just taking for granted like the whole situation of how good we have it right now and that this is a thing. Yeah, but to, to answer what Matt was saying about the idea of having the like open edition thing, that's that doesn't account for people who are only just getting into the format literally the next day, right? Like I think about that all the time about the things that people petition us to repress or things that were on our site and only sold out like a month ago. And then people act like we, it's been out of stock for years yeah. or that we haven't pressed it in two decades and we're just being selfish by not pressing it. Meanwhile, it was on the site for a full three years and barely moved and we had no intention of ever reselling it. And people are just like, you know, uh, and, and it's always interesting to see that because it, that means that people are always getting into the format. People are always just discovering it. And, uh, you know, uh, Matt, we've had this conversation about how and Spencer, same thing, that how like some of the most valuable records that are on Discogs right now are records that came out like four years ago, three years ago, that limited run stuff by pop artists who made vinyl because they wanted to. And now it's just rare and out, out of print and people treat it like it's something that was made in this 1969 that was pressed with like a weird typo on it, you know? Yep. You can say her name. Her name is Taylor Swift. You can say <laughs> I find it really hard to keep up with the demand these days from everyone that's getting into things and discovering vinyl for the first times. And then once something, you know, sells out in two, three minutes, they, um, you know, they blame you like you hurt them personally because we go through that a lot. And uh, we get these emails where we like, you know, they're upset with us. They hate us because something went on sale. We didn't create enough. And uh, it's, it's hard to keep up with the demand these days. It's also hard to predict demand. Yes. Right. And like a lot of these things are expensive licenses and like, Yep. It's, it's hard, like, like we have to lay out a lot of money up front and like for us personally, we always try to make more when we can, but you know, every deal is different uh, legally and like, yeah, people come at us angry that like, like how could you make this many like Transformers come from my um, The first pressing, it was the first time it was released on any format. So like, we obviously assumed there was some sort of demand, but it only being on, on vinyl is kind of weird for the first time. So we made 2,000 copies, they sold out immediately, and we got like literal death threats. Yeah, we were yeah. like ready to call the cops. Like if this <laughs> one guy just kept going, I was like, we need to do something. Like, Meanwhile, we announced we were making more, and we would be making more, just he wanted the Optimus Prime variant of the first pressing that that was worth threatening us. And now and now, when uh, represses are still taking, you know, nine to you know 12 months to come out, it's like, well, you gotta wait. <laughs> yeah. I would say for me, I made the choice of prioritizing costs because I feel right now everything is very expensive for people. So this is the first reason is that I know there are other labels that are better than me to appeal to collectors. Uh, but in the cop in the last two years, in the last few years, I really made the choice that I feel it's better to make a product for myself, and not a, a product that's affordable for the largest group of people. That if I have a choice between a little extra stuff and have to sell it $40. I'd rather have a simple get full and sell it $29 to make sure that people can afford it. Because I feel like everywhere you look, everywhere you want to buy now, scattering to people who have a larger disposable income. And I don't know. Uh, I want to make it widely available as possible. Yeah, also, because I know there are people who are much better than me to do this beautiful collectible uh, product as well. And I mean, as, as someone who buys records, I appreciate that because I, I personally, and this is just me admitting my own truth that like, I don't care about colored vinyl. I don't care about fancy packaging. When I'm buying a record for myself, like I open it, I enjoy it in general, but like it, when I'm just buying like my favorite band's record, you know, like if I was going to the store tomorrow to buy, say, say today's In Reverie, right? Like we were just discussing, like if it just was as it was in its original pressing, just like single pocket, just an insert in a, in a sleeve, whatever, and it was 
1999, I'd be stoked instead of having to spend $40 on a deluxe thing. Or, you know, I remember I was waiting for Tom Petty's Wildflowers for so long, so long. And then when given the option, when that finally came out, there was like the regular edition, it's like $29.99, but also, hey, we got like this six LP version, a nine LP version, a 14 version LP version. And I was just sort of like, Cool. I'll take the, the original two LP version. Black vinyl sounds great. I'm all in. Let's that is an amazing it. record, but I think 14 is a little too many. Okay. Just, a, just <laughs> a little, a little, a little much. What I particularly dislike is when people sell signed copies more expensive than the regular copy just because it's signed. Uh, yes. You see that sometime. Also, when labels uh, have a significant upcharge for like a cut, like a single color versus black, because that's not a massive difference. In no, the it's not. So, like some some labels will be like nineteen ninety nine for the black and thirty five dollars for the red. It's like what? You got, you got to yeah, suck that up as a label. Yeah. If you, you know, it's it's as a label, it's our decision to press crazy effects and colors. You can't charge people money for you know your whims. To yeah. me, well, well, at the most, yeah. charge like charge like two or three dollars more. Don't yeah. don't double yeah. it. You know, yeah. you know it's very to your second point. It's very hard to, especially now with the the longest production period. It's very hard to just make an open order and then wait to see how many you're gonna have in pre-orders to then decide to manufacture because you add more months to the entire process. And I do think we're all struggling with this. Is that you're trying to guess to the best of your availability what the demand is going to be to get it out in decent times. And if you wait for pre-orders, it's very, I found it, I tried it once. I found it very difficult. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, so I was going to switch over to our slideshow presentation because we're, we're already halfway through this, this bad boy. Um, unless there's something else you want, you had on your list, Matt, before I, I pivoted over. We can, any other questions? We, if we have time at the end, I'll jump in. I think we're good. We're good for slideshow. All right, guys, what you've all been waiting for, <laughs> all of our fun things. Uh, uh, Ryan, you didn't bring anything to the party. Is there anything you want to uh, present before we get started? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> He's just happy to be here. Yes. <laughs> all right, so. Let's see how this goes. All right. So you're up first, Darren. Straight in at the deep end. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I can, yeah, we can do right. a little further warm up if you want. Um, no, cool. Okay. So first up, I've got Let Us Pray, um, Brian O'Malley film from 2014. Yeah. Oh, I work by Ben Turner. He's done a really great reverse sleeve, and there's some excellent artwork going on with that. Uh, Steve Lynch score, Rory Carpenter with a bit of orchestral going in. Yeah, fantastic. Looking forward to getting that one out as soon as possible. Yeah, the artwork's amazing. Yeah, really happy with how this one's come together. And uh, next uh, is The Descent, which uh, we haven't got any artwork for that yet. So this is just a little heads up tease. Um, but yeah, the Neil Marshall film. And uh, David Julian's first score on vinyl so yeah really looking forward to getting this one out probably early next year that's that's a huge release man yeah that's awesome yeah wow. yeah it's a favorite of mine <clears throat> and then uh lastly the stylist which is the most good to go probably next two or three weeks this will be out <laughs> artwork by sarah deck um we work with arrow video on this one and yeah that should be good to go pretty soon that artwork, artwork is incredible, Sarah, as always. I love that. Truly, truly amazing. That's awesome. That's it, thanks. These are, these are all coming out this year? The Descent is probably early next year, but yeah, the Stylist is due probably two to three weeks, hoping that will arrive fairly soon. And uh, Let Us Pray will be towards the end of the year. Very cool, very cool. All right, Aaron, you're up next. Hey. Hey, yeah, so we got a couple of things. Um, Beautiful Joe, which is actually going to be um, this Tuesday. Um, oh, wow. So, yeah, so wanted to, you know, get that out there. New artwork by Drew Wise. Uh, it folds out. I mean, you only see the cover mm -hmm. here, but it folds that out. Art. sort of like a, look like a one sheet of a tokusatsu 
we based it on an Ultraman poster, and then the inside is a it's a gatefold that we um, based on a, a, the box of a common Rider figure from the '60s. I was gonna say uh, shout out to Drew cool. Wise. I I've been watching <laughs> Drew Wise's art for so long now, and he's so good. Everything he does is just yep. He's the hardest working man in video game soundtracks. Like, yeah, for, I mean, for sure. So many things. But yeah, so that'll be on this coming Tuesday. We'll have it on the on the site and it'll be shipping in like a couple of a couple of months. Um, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, the artwork's incredible. I love it. Yeah, it came out really good. Uh, and then, yeah, Power Stone, which is the cult Dreamcast fighting game um, with we did new artwork. A lot of people, I've shown this artwork to a lot of people and they think it's like the real artwork, like the key art, but it was actually done by Mike Lucas, who's done a few pieces for us. Um, and yeah, it came out really good and that'll be coming out later this year sometime. Definitely out this year though. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much, uh, that's all I had to share this time, but we have a lot of things coming out this year, a lot more stuff, but it's all I could really show. But um, hopefully people are excited about Beautiful Joe because that artwork took forever to make, <laughs> but it came out really good. <laughs> yeah, people in the chat are pretty excited about Beautiful Joe. Cool. Ross and Michelle, what do you guys got coming up later this year? Uh, this one um, been in the works for a while, like a year and a half. Uh, that art is an original uh, international poster art from when the film was released that I thought was incredible. That would make an incredible album cover. So it's been like a year trying to get the rights cleared and finally did. And uh, that should be out probably early next year, maybe the end of this year. We just got test pressing. So I guess we'll see how long things take. That artwork is so good. I was actually, that was my question was where did that come from? And yeah, uh, as soon as I saw it. Is that the like, French I, poster? Is uh, that the French I poster? I think it was. I feel like I've seen poster. it. I'm not positive. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, because, yeah. It looks great. I love it. Thank you. Yeah, as soon as I saw it, I knew it would make an incredible album poster, or album cover, rather. Yeah, this is good. And then uh, this is uh, Psychos in Love which is um, an amazing awesome. uh, B-movie <laughs> horror. Uh, we're working with Vinegar Syndrome on this one. Um, we actually have those finished. If you guys want to switch to like the live view, we yeah, actually have yeah. those in hand. Yeah. I, I love that movie. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm having a hard time. Oh, uh, oh wow. How to awesome. do this wow. again. Amazing. Awesome. I love that. I love so that. Good. I'm really jealous. You Almost getting it. it. I'll get it. I'll get it eventually. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There it is. Oh, oh, it's all. Uh, it's all awesome. It's, uh, there was a seven inch, which was like most of the soundtrack. This is full bonus tracks plus screen printed B side, new artwork, which is awesome. Um, we got. And we got a uh, lot of notes from the director with the original artwork. So this is out real soon, I think in... Uh, it's either going to be August or September. About a month. Late late August, probably. But yeah, we're really excited about that one. The music is like... It, it's available digital. I suggest people check it out. It's so 80s in the best way. It's, it's lots, really of, lots of 808s and synth. And it's... I, I fucking love the soundtrack. It's one of my personal favorite soundtracks I think we've done musically. And then the last one is a really weird one. It is uh, the Lancelot Link in the Evolution Revolution, um, also in conjunction with uh, Vinegar Syndrome slash Film Chest, which is a company they run. Um, this is a TV show. It was actually um, the writers from the Carol Burnett show and Get Smart got together and made this show as, you know, um, they had all these animals. They had crazy, like, if you look into it, they had really crazy budgets. And, like, the stuff they did just... It was so fun, and they had this band, The Evolution Revolution, and I don't know, it's just, it's something, I think that's so cool, and, like, the design of it, we, like, paid homage to uh, James Bond, like, vinyl and things like that. We wanted to, like, have a little bit of a feel of that. The show is a secret agent-type show, and it has literal chimps mouthing words, and then they got... Uh, actors from the Carol Burnett show and get smart to do the voice acting. It's out there. That said, the music is, it came out in 1970 or 71. This is the 50th anniversary. And uh, the music is like 
straight 70s, like monkeys kind of pop. So <laughs> musically, it's great. and <laughs> It's a weird show, but it's awesome. fun. The comments in the chat right now are amazing. <laughs> also, the album comes with a download card of music videos of the entire album. So you get like 10 videos of chimps singing and dancing and playing power pop from the 70s. <laughs> That's right, the nice. work right there. Very cool. <laughs> All right, Johnny on the beach. Let's hear all, all about right. it. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. So these are uh, the digital digital proofs for uh, Kaiji. And Kaiji will be coming out when I get home in about a week or so because it's going to be shipping with um, our Hunter Hunter repress. So this is a really cool double LP, amazing, amazing score. So this is uh, one of the first three or four Kaiji records that's coming out soon. Yeah, part part in the uh, the guidelines from the template, John was was uh, I imagine just sitting under a, a coconut tree, uh, <laughs> and he remembered that he had to send some slide images, and uh, this is what came in. But yep. uh, it... <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Mo came in at what ten this morning. Yeah. So Here is uh, the artwork for our Redline release. Really excited about this. This score is amazing. Uh, we're expected to have this out this fall, and our friends in the UK, all the anime, are going to have an exclusive picture disc of this record, too. This one's pretty fun. So this is the artwork reveal for our Death Note Apple box set six LPs. This is a uh, courtesy of uh, Tony Giles. He says hi everybody too at home. Um, he's got the proof there, and this will be coming out this uh, this fall. It was great. Thank you. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Thanks, that's guys. Awesome. And then was, all it hard, was it hard to get the licensor to agree to do some an original cover like this? No, no. Um, we ha we have a really good relationship with them, um, so. Uh, yeah, it wasn't that difficult for us. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. And then um, I'll just drop this because I, I got a few uh, DMs in the past hour. Um, we are going to be doing uh, a bunch of uh, initial D records as well. Yes! Sorry, that was so. up. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Oh, man. That's amazing. So I, feel, I feel like I could say that since I just signed the contract, so we are good with that. Oh, that's so fantastic. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. That's clearly one of my favorites. Like. <laughs> like, I keep forgetting we're like live, and I'm like, oh my goodness. Yeah, it'll, it'll be a good time. I can't wait to tell my husband now. He's gonna be really excited. He, got, he I collect most of the vinyl, and he has some stuff. But like, I know he'll be like, so what colors are they gonna have this in? Like, what are they gonna do? So I know I'm gonna have to pick up a few. Gotcha. I, of course, I'll send them to you. This is gonna be a fun release. Really fun exactly. releases. JC, you're up. I know you got quite a few in here, but also you're gonna, you're gonna drop some some uh, verbal teases for us as well. So we'll get started. So this is uh, volume two of the season one of the series FLCL. Again, more songs by the Pillows. Um, it's gonna probably drop early next year with uh, a launch uh, in the fall. Uh, and we're partnering also with all the anime where they're going to release the album in Europe and we're handing America. And it's, again, a lot of great indie rock songs by uh, The Pillows. Awesome. And uh, this is the, the soundtrack to the season five of My Hero Academia. Uh, it's in production right now. Same composer who's done the entire franchise, Yuki Ayayushi. And same thing as FLCL, that's going to come out uh, probably early next year with a launch in the fall. And this one I'm very excited about. Uh, it comes out next week. So it's uh, it's a new score by Yuchi Sakamoto. It's Minamata. It's a movie about the toxic spill in the 70s in Minamata in Japan. And the movie is not out yet, but it's a gorgeous score by Yuchi Sakamoto where he goes back to his more orchestral roots. It has beautiful piano theme. Uh, it's coming out next, uh, uh, yeah, next week, next Friday. Uh, it's, uh, it's, if you're a fan of Yuchi Sakamoto, you're going to love this. Awesome.
uh, and net and net. Uh, so this is that already came out in France. So this is the musical with Adam Driver and Marion Cotillard by Leo Scarax. I don't know if you're familiar with Leo Scarax, but he was a very kind of enfant terrible director in the 80s in France. And that's like a very dark musical where all the songs were written uh, by the Ben Sparks. And the vinyl is coming out in the US in August at the same time as the film. I'm so excited to finally hear this. Yeah, that's really, yeah. I'm so hyped for that movie and the soundtrack. Thank you. Yeah. And this one I'm very, also very excited about. Uh, Daniel Hart is probably my favorite composer working right now with Colin Stetson. This is a new movie by David Lowry. We did a ghost story. Uh, the vinyl is in production as well. Uh, not sure when it's going to come out because of what we discussed before. I mean, it's a gorgeous medieval score with a lot of modern elements and strange songs. It's, uh, it's a beautiful soundtrack. Yeah, I uh, I got to see the movie a couple of days ago and it rules and I almost wanted to message you as soon as I walked out being like, yo, <laughs> JC, <laughs> what about that hookup, that exclusive? Uh, very excited about this one, yeah. truly. Um, yeah, that's quite the haul, quite the haul. But we also have a couple of collaborations coming up, yes. right? Yeah, so uh, we're going to do, we got the rights to release the soundtrack to Titan. Uh, the film that just won the Cannes Film Festival, and we're going to partner with uh, Mondo to release uh, the soundtrack by Jim Williams. Uh, and what else do we have together that's coming soon? Uh, we, we have Gunpowder Milkshake. Yeah. Coming up with you guys this year. At some point. And we also have um, Maze Street. And the soundtrack for May's Dream, which is the Sophia Coppola movie, the soundtrack by uh, Blood Orange, Devonta. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. And Dev really graciously went into the studio and recorded uh, a, an exclusive vocal track for the vinyl release that will not be available on any screen. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. And, and, I guess that movie went under the radar a little bit because it came out during the pandemic. But it's, it's, a, it's a great movie and the score is like fantastic. So, and Titan's score is like. Yeah. Since I, I trust I trust JC because he's actually French. Can you tell me how that movie's name is actually pronounced so I can I can lord it over my American friends? Titan. 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 All right, you heard it here, everyone. You heard an actual <laughs> French person pronounce the name. <laughs> And then the Titan. <laughs> um, cool. Well, uh, if that's it, I think that the next slide is moving on to our stuff. Um, I can't remember what I have up first, but uh, let's see. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So uh, uh, this movie's coming out in a couple of days. I guess in like a week or two, uh, it rules. The soundtrack is great. It's basically James Gunn's next mixtape album. It's it's great. I can't wait for you all to see it and hear it. Uh, see it in IMAX if you have one nearby and if you feel safe enough to do so. And uh, that'll be on sale when the film comes out. So uh, check it out and yeah. Oh, wow. Spence, oh, wow. you want to talk a little bit about this? Well, full Metal Jacket, this is, this is almost finished up pressing. So we're pressing this at Got a Groove. We are doing the Wax Mage Run 20, which we will run a competition to give some away. Um, the full package design is by Alan Hines, and it is freaking insane. It's so good. And... It, because Alan is such a madman and he's so awesome and we just let him do anything that he wants. <laughs> We've also made um, 20 uh, toy packages that feature some of the toys that are on the cover that we're going to give away with these Wax, wax Mage variants. Um, and I'm just super excited to carry on working with the Kubrick estate. Um, big shout out to Pat Thomas, our, our contact, who uh, helps us with all the Kubrick stuff. Um, yeah, so 
you know, full metal jacket, man. Yeah, this is just the Obi strip for anyone who's curious. I didn't want to re do the art re reveal because that's going to be a big deal when it comes out. But this is just what the the spine wrap looks like. <laughs> but, but the actual package design is pretty is pretty crazy. Um. So a lot of a lot of our Mission Impossible collecting fans have been asking for a little while about the infamous box set, which uh, which is something that I I had mentioned on a on a podcast, the Mission Impossible podcast that Drew and um, uh, the Light the Fuse podcast that 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 goes out uh, Charles and Drew's podcast. But uh, this is the mock up for it, uh, and uh, there's a tease of Ghost Protocol, which is which is what it'll come with. If you buy uh, uh, Ghost Protocol, you will get the slipcase for your um, your first four, because there's obviously another four titles in the franchise, so we'll make it a volume two when that comes out. And then uh, this, I think I've seen some people in the chat asking some questions about. Spence, you want to talk a little bit about this? <laughs> this actually exists. That's an actual record. Uh, it seems to have taken forever. So we're going to kick off um, our Toho releases with um, Return of Godzilla. And the artwork is by Henry Abrams, who, if you picked up the Michael Giacchino record that he released, Last year, he did the cover art on that, and it's amazing. And Henry's fucking awesome. Um, and that's going to be out in. Did we just move that to August, right? Mm -hmm. I think I, I left it vague to give us some time. It says beginning in a few weeks, but yes, technically, yeah. we, it was supposed to be next week, but we moved it uh, a few more weeks so that we can have it in hand so we can begin to, to talk about it. The, the reason this hasn't been released yet is because the package is pretty special, right? So we just want to have it in-house so we can video the package being open and, and see it. Um, and then after Return of Godzilla, we have uh, Godzilla vs. Destroyer, which is one of my personal favorite movies in the franchise. And that artwork is by uh, Wes Benskier, who's like, now the artwork is insane. Um, I have Matt Taylor has just dropped sketches in for Space Amoeba. Um, uh, Graham Humphrey is working on Matango. So we got a ton of Toho titles down the pike. Like, I think it's 17 or 18 titles in, in, in total over the next few years. And I'm very excited and very proud that we're releasing these. Yeah, I've seen some some questions coming in about the specific titles, uh, and I guess it's I, I'm actually super not really good with the Godzilla stuff, so it, it's I think that I don't know what the window of time of titles that we're working on, but uh, is this like the '80s stuff or what is it? Yeah, this is like '90s stuff as well. '90s stuff, yeah, yeah, 80s, 90s. It's, it's 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 a lot of the latest stuff. Um, it's a lot of stuff that maybe flies under people's radars, but like if you haven't seen like. You know, that's, 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 that's one of the best films in the franchise for me, anyway. And then we have a ton of non Godzilla tiles that we're doing with Toho as well. Um, yeah, we're, Toho have been amazing. Big shout out to So, yeah, really awesome. Uh, we are continuing our Ghostbusters series. We did Ghostbusters 1 with uh, with uh, Sony Masterworks, and uh, they asked us shortly after if we'd ever want to do Go uh, Ghostbusters 2. And so I think there's another a, a, a standard version of this that's also sort of out in the wild at the moment, but just wanted to let everyone know that in case anyone was wondering if we are doing our own version like they, we did last time, we are also doing our own Ghostbusters 2 with artwork by Paul Mann again. So... Uh, stay on it. Uh, should be coming out closer to the end of the year, I believe. Need more Vigo. Yeah, I know. Definitely more <laughs> Vigo. I uh, wanted to officially let everyone know, because people ask about this all the time, uh, that now that we just put out our most recent uh, John Williams score, that our next John Williams title is going to be the 30th anniversary of Hook, uh, similar to what we did with... Um, uh, uh, Superman just now. We worked with Michael Madicino, uh, this amazing producer who works really, really closely with the John Williams camp to make sure all of his stuff sounds perfect and does everything. Uh, we he, he helped us produce uh, new masters for this, and it'll be coming out, uh, I think, for the 30th anniversary in November. That's the plan right now. We're working on artwork. Uh, nothing to share just yet. 
but uh, that's coming up on the horizon. And then I think I only have one more slide, so uh, I'll close with this one, because I already teased it on Instagram at one point, but in case anyone didn't catch it, we're doing our next Pixar title, which is going to be up with artwork by Nicole Gustafson, who did our um, Ratatouille artwork. Uh, it's, I mean, it's the score has been out in on like a picture disc through Disney before, but this will be the first uh, standard vinyl, you know, non-picture disc version of the album. We're quite excited about it. Um, it'll actually be out in just a few weeks. So um, that's it. I've seen uh, to all the people who have been throwing in a bunch of titles they want to see from us. Uh, unfortunately, you know, people have been asking about Mandalorian two and a couple of the Marvel things. We only have, I think, one or two other Disney titles technically coming out this year we have another star wars thing that's not the mandalorian sorry um and we have another um uh, uh another disney title as well coming out that's not uh, uh one of the many other things that people have asked about shout out to the guy who always asks about the rock but we will be uh we will be doing um uh, uh, well, our attempt is to get to some of those things eventually, trust me, but we, we don't have those on the horizon at the very, very moment. Uh, but let me see if I can get back to, yeah, I got back. <laughs> <laughs> Stall for time while you look for the right button. Um, someone, someone posted up a, a bit earlier, Glenn, saying you're going to be broke forever. <laughs> <laughs> is, yeah, apologies. I mean, I also just saw someone, different. someone in the chat straight up boo Mission Impossible, which I thought was very funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's, an, it's an aggressive take. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wish. Honestly, that would be really fun, right? Yeah. That'd be a great troll to just to be like, hey, guys, sorry I can't do Mando 2. I'm doing the Caravan of Courage. Uh, <laughs> um we're actually at time, so I don't know if anyone else had anything they needed to get to before we hopped off, um, but otherwise, I don't want to overextend our time here, but does anyone else have anything else they want to tease or say or, or answer before we get out of here? I really appreciate you guys coming on, by the way. Yeah, this was super fun. Yeah, yeah. We keep talking about doing it uh, not for the public view so we can all just have drinks and, and say all the things we want to say on here without the public's <laughs> discrimination. Uh, but uh, we should do that sometime and uh, you know, we'll, we'll stay in touch, but you know, as things open up and then close down again, but hopefully open up, up again next year, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to see each other in real life and do this for real sometime. But uh, thanks everyone for coming to hang out. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Matt, for, for, for emceeing there in the middle. I really appreciate it. And um, I hope you guys all have a good rest of your Saturday and good weekend. And JC, congrats again on, Thank the, you. Uh, on the little one. Yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. We'll see Thank you everyone. again soon. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.